Good evening and welcome to Swangan. I'm Stan Rubin. Kriegagik was once the largest inevaluate whaling village located at the mouth of the Mackenzie River. Sod houses now sunken and eroded once stretched all along the banks of Kriegagik. Remnants of our people lay silent over graves of whalers, hunters, trappers, and even families. In the early days of contact with outsiders, many Inuit were susceptible to disease and once the flu hit, it was devastating to the population. The Kitigagic Oral Traditions Project gives us the glimpse into our people that lived and died on the shores of Kitigagic. Our thanks to coordinator Kathy Cockney for allowing us the use of this footage shot by Dennis Allen. Kitigagic is located approximately 25 miles west from Tuktuyukto. It was a traditional whaling camp for centuries. Sod houses and old log houses now remain. Slowly, wind and water erosion has taken its toll of houses, grave sites, and artifacts, washing them away during high water. Through the Oral Traditions Project, we learn about Kirigaryuk and who used to live here in the old days. I'm Steve Solomon. I work for the Geological Survey of Canada, and I'm sitting in a Quonset hut on Kirigazulit Island in the, uh, at the mouth of the Mackenzie River. I was asked to come out here to look at the site, I guess, of uh, a village of a thousand or more people back at the turn of the century. And now all that remains is pretty much graves and uh, the ruins of sod houses and uh, caches of whale meat, which have been left behind. Uh, I'm a coastal geologist and, uh, for the Geological Survey. And what that means is I go around and I look at areas, especially in the Arctic, where uh, coastlines are changing. Uh, natural processes in the north and many places and, and human activity uh, cause changes along coastlines. Uh, in some parts of the Arctic, uh, in the Beaufort Sea, coastlines change very dramatically from one year to the next. Uh, in parts of the delta, the coastline can change as much as 15 or 20 years in a single year, sometimes as a result of just a single storm. At uh, Kitigazwit, uh, which is much closer to the mouth of the Mackenzie River and much farther away from a lot of active wave and waves in particular, uh, coastal changes is not coastal change is not quite that dramatic. But we see at this archaeological site a lot of changes uh, and a lot of changes which are yet to come. Uh, the coastline here consists primarily of fairly high cliffs, some of which are fairly steep and some of which are not so steep. Some have a lot of vegetation growing on them and some of them are completely bare. And that gives us clues as to the kinds of processes which are occurring here and to some extent how rapidly they may be occurring. Uh, one of the reasons I was asked to come out here was uh, to try and figure out or give some advice as to what parts of this archaeological site might be more or less in danger from uh, attacking waves and currents, which would cause the banks to erode and artifacts to wash into the sea, and not only artifacts, but grave sites as well. There's not a lot of ice in the sediments here. It's mostly sand with a little bit of gravel. And as the surface melts in the summertime, the sand slides down. And at the bottom of the cliff, waves and currents, especially during flood times or um, westerly winds which raise water levels, they can eat away at the sand at the base of the cliffs. And when that sand, it's called the toe of the cliffs. And when that sand at the toe of the cliffs is removed, it makes the bottom of the cliff, cliff steeper. And anybody who, who's built a sand castle knows that when you have too steep a bank, the sand will all collapse. So what happens is the sand when the, when the currents and, and waves make the cliff steeper, the sand runs down. And at the very top, even though there's vegetation, 
it gets undercut and the vegetation falls in. So walking along the cliffs, uh, uh, most of the cliffs, especially on the east side of Kitigazuit, uh, you'll see that they're barren of vegetation and most of the uh, the sand is, is falling down at a, fa at, a, at a pace which is fast enough so there isn't any vegetation which can grow on it. So you just see blank faces of, uh, of sand which is moving fairly constantly. Unfortunately, we haven't done enough work here to determine what kind of rates that is, whether it's, it's causing the banks to erode at one meter per year or two meters per year. Less, is, it could be even more than that. As you go around to more protected parts of Kittigazwood Island on the west side, which, which is not open to the, the more active currents and wave processes, but uh, is, there's still some current activity. It was surprising to me how active those cliffs were as well. In general, they're better vegetated, so they're moving at a slower rate, uh, almost almost creeping down the slope as opposed to just running down the slope. Uh, in those areas, a couple of areas, there look like there might be some evidence for uh, thermal activity, which means that, uh, especially in, in certain parts of the Beaufort, there can be a lot of ice developed in the cliffs. And when that ice melts out, uh, the land surface can, can subside very quickly and can erode very quickly as well. There's not a lot of evidence for those kinds of processes occurring, but... Sod houses used to be. There are a number of different types of houses that may be represented here. Um, this is uh, one of the most uh, common or typical kind, and it's often referred to as a, a cruciform-shaped sod house. That means it's a house, um, it's somewhat semi-subterranean in that um, it was dug into the ground to give it better insulation. It's cruciform in that it has three alcoves um, or rooms, each which could be occupied by a family. To get into the house, um, the people would have to enter through a tunnel that's acted as a coal trap tunnel, and it was below the ground, it was below the level of the floor of the house, and the people would come in through the tunnel and then go up through a trapdoor into the house uh, where it would be nice and warm. The history here we know goes back at least 500 years and um, there have been many occupations over the years and there's probably quite a lot of houses, one on top of another on top of another. And uh, it makes it difficult to identify an individual house. The house that you see here happens to be a very good example. It may have been uh, one of the last sod houses used in this area because it's very well defined by um, sort of a, an oval berm, um, a raised berm with a, a depression, a very distinct depression in the middle. And sometimes you can see the remains of the, uh, the tunnel entrance as well leading out of the house. And it seems that most of the entrances faced towards the water. Uh, in other cases, it's really just a jumble, and so it's hard for us to identify specific houses, but uh, during the survey we've identified 19. This is the foundation of the Hudson's Bay Company store and two warehouses. The Hudson's Bay Company established a post here in 1912, and it ran until 1934, at which time um, it was moved to Taktoyaktuk. Uh, the store here was a log building, as was this uh, most northwest warehouse. And the warehouse on the other side of the store was made of corrugated metal. Um, in front of the Hudson's Bay Company store was uh, an elevated walkway to help get over a marshy area. And uh, Elder Emmanuel Felix uh, talked about how much fun it was playing on the walkway when he was here as a child. We think this may be the approximate location of a structure called a kejigi, or some people refer to it as a ceremonial house or a men's house. And uh, it was described uh, around the turn of the century by uh, Reverend Whitaker as being about 30, meter, uh, 30 feet by 30 feet square. Um, and it was a log building, and inside it had uh, seats all the way around, sort of bench seats, except, of course, at the doorway. 
and um, apparently the, the men used to gather here to work on their equipment um, to hold ceremonies related to a successful hunt and uh, various other activities. I'm standing at the foundation of the Anglican mission that was here at uh, Kitigariwi. The missionary activities were first started by Isaac O. Stringer, um, probably around 1896. Uh, an actual mission building, a log building, was constructed in 1911 by uh, Reverends Fry and Young. And um, we're not sure at this time uh, when missionary activities ceased. One interesting detail about uh, about those missionary activities is that the uh, the um, Church of England actually seemed to have taken ownership of land here at Kitigari Meet. And on the Hudson Bay Company Post plans, we can see a large tract of land that says it belongs to the Church of England. Um, and in uh, 1923, uh, the plans say that the church wishes, wishes to return the land, to whom I'm not sure. We're standing here in the Anglican graveyard. Um, there are 11 graves here that we can see. I think that there are likely uh, quite a few others that we can no longer detect. Um, most of the, the deaths here we're able to, tr to uh, track from the church records and uh, the earliest grave, a Christian grave here, is from 1913, and uh, they go to 1928. And um, people died from a variety of reasons, we found, uh, from ptomaine poisoning to um, a series of devastating epidemics, um, such as the one of uh, 1928, which was the Spanish flu. Well, all of these just look to most people like just scattered sticks, partly rotted, and of course these are the remains of an old grave and grave offerings on top of the grave. And this one, if you can just have a look over here, somebody's put this together. We're not sure whether it's correct, but it's uh, uh, somewhat correct. This is a sled with these upturned ends. And you must remember all of this woodwork, which uh, if you look at it closely, it looks like dimension timber you get from a lumber store, but it's been worked down just with hand tools, no table saws, saws of course, a few hundred years ago. And so this has just been wedged out from logs from the beach and then worked down with stone tools and some little bits of iron. And uh, so if you just have a look at this, it's a, a short sled with the cross pieces here. This would have been all lashed with uh, raw hide and baleen and these sleds would have been shoed with uh, the runners would have had these shoes made of uh, whalebone just pegged into them. Here's a number of other uh, uh, runners for sleds. You can notice how sophisticated these are. I'll start to get you into the real details. Like they, they look rough, but when these were first made, they would have been just shining and polished. They would have been polished down with sandstone, which is good as any sandpaper you can buy in the store. If you notice here, See these grains going up like this? People would have searched all up and down the beach for a, a tree that the root would be coming out like this just to match the flow of this, so this would be very strong. All of these follow the grain beautifully, so they were really selecting their wood well. And most trees spiral when you cut them, so uh, they would have to look for trees that you could wedge, pound wedges in to split. Some of these logs would have been this big. They would have split them down, found the right ones to take a straight, straight line. <clears throat> uh, here's an interesting uh, couple of pieces. This would be the drum hoop. It's similar to a hoop that you'd have around uh, for the kayak, combing, but the combing is quite a bit wider and uh, we have one, an example elsewhere on the site. If you have a close up on that, that's baleen lashing going through there. There's actually would have been lashed on. See those little holes like that? This would have been lashed together. And this would have been brought together. There might have been another piece. And this would have been a big drum with uh, a rawhide skin stretched around here on this hoop. It's still very intact, even though it may be a few uh, hundred years old. In most of this material, there's no iron. So it's, it's quite, it's uh, before uh, trade was going on. A few of the areas have uh, square nails in them and ordinary nails so you know it's more recent maybe a hundred years ago or so. 
It's the, the, the stem of a big canoe, uh, uh, umiak. It's like a big canoe. And these uh, umiaks, from measuring some of the pieces and piecing them together, are probably 30 feet long and five to six feet wide. And uh, this one piece, this follows the grain of the, uh, of the big spruce log that it would be cut out of. And it's about uh, three meters long, 10 feet, or feet long, and comes up here. And this would have been the stem piece of the, of the umiak. And uh, the so-called keelson, the piece that goes along the bottom, and then the gunnel that goes along the top, we've got some other examples of gunnel. The keelson is here, and it would fit in these little notches here. And this is whale baleen lashing that would have held this onto here. So this would have been the part of the frame that frames the bottom. And then there would have been cross pieces across here, like this, to join in here. See this mortars here and this tenon? And these all uh, on the pieces that are more, uh, more uh, recent or the ones that haven't rotted so much, they, f they fit beautifully. And they're pegged in here. The peg is gone from here, but there's some of the pegs they're showing and baleen lashing. And I think partly the lashing was used so much, the baleen lashing was used because it wasn't as brittle as the pegging. So the whole boat would probably move a little bit. So it'd be flexible as it rides over the waves. So this is a cross piece. Again, this is just the floor of the umiak. And then a piece of wood like this, only very different, uh, well, the same sort of size, but differently carved uh, dimension or configuration would be the gunnel that uh, goes up the top here. And then a series of ribs are put uh, between the gunnel and the uh, this bottom piece. I know it's a bit, uh, bit confusing unless we had a piece, uh, a whole umiak, and maybe we should someday build one of these just to show p people how uh, wonderful the woodwork was. Just with, with hand tools, just uh, little bits of iron and stone tools. Um, let's see if we've got, uh, these are just more, more pieces lying around that have been scattered off the graves and uh, these, this is, uh, see, it's rotted out here, of course, uh, with the weather as it gets wet. Maybe that was sitting in the ground for a while and it rotted out. This, this piece is a rib. These uh, don't show off too well because, again, it's rotted, but there's a little saddle notch. It's very subtle, but that would have fit, and there would have been one under here. It would have fit on the, uh, on the uh, chine, it's actually called on the edge of the uh, umiak and the uh, gunnel up here. So that would have been the rib. Lashed again with baleen lashing, which is very, very strong, and it doesn't rot in water. So that's why it's, it's better than using rawhide or sinew. Those, those rot in a while in water, so you can't use them for long. Parts of these pieces that you can tell that they came from quite a beautifully built uh, uh, umiak. Uh, this is a a piece is quite fragile and the the keel or keelson is the proper term was pieced together with three long pieces of timber that were carefully carved here's the baleen showing it's all rotted away here but this shows you that these people had some iron it might have been traded from Alaska or Siberia traders or but it was iron by the way the ads marks have, are showing in here and so this was called a a scarf joint. So it would have been scarfed on or, or lashed on. The next piece would have been a big piece like this, along like that, and it would have been lashed on here and, and a number of other lashings in here. Um, this is all quite fragile. Even a piece like this that just looks like a stick. This has all been worked laboriously. This would pr probably, a piece like this is beautiful straight grain. It would have been very carefully selected and worked down with a crooked knife that, or, or a piece of flint and uh, sandstone. And this would have been called a stringer. It would have gone the, on the sides of the omiak to hold the skin away from the ribs. There's a few other, few other interesting pieces. These scattered boards around here are the omiak seats. And of course the omiak is wide in the middle and this one is one of the wider ones 
it probably would have stretched out to here and they might might have this is only maybe three and a half four feet uh, these the bigger of these boats probably is five feet wide and you can tell these are umiak seats because of the no notch that goes here and their lashing hole here and uh, that that notch would have fit on one of the ribs so that's the seat in the umiak the ribs would have been down here and fit very tightly in here and lashing would have held them all tightly together. These boats were, would have carried a number of people on whale hunts or moving the community or a number of families so they had to be very strong but light at the same time and so they built them out of relatively small pieces of wood but because of all this intricate lashing that you know if you tear it all apart like this it's a lot of engineering going on to hold it to, together. And there's a lot of triangles and different sort of forces going on that make it uh, terribly strong. So that's one of the narrow seats, one of the seats that, uh, and this is a bit larger seat. And uh, here's an interesting piece that shows the, uh, uh, the chine, the bottom piece that goes around the, the length of the umiak. And it shows the cro one of the cross pieces that is just fallen out here and it fits in in a notch here and you can see the pegging hole sometimes they're pegged sometimes they're lashed so you can see how beautifully that would have fit in there just as if it was done by a modern day carpenter with planes and things but it's just as beautiful with the old hand tools in fact the workmanship on pieces that we see that aren't so rotten, it's, it's more sculptural than with modern tools because they weren't using planes and surfaces that make everything go straight. It's more sculptural, so if they wanted something oval, it'd go from an oval and then into, if they wanted something rectangular for some other strength features, it'd, it'd flow beautifully. It's more like sculpture than like a piece of carpentry. When we came here, my grandfather was getting too old and he was getting getting uh, too old and me and my mom were trapped uh, by that. Mm -hmm. Go with my mom all the time. So she taught you how to hunt and trap too? Hmm? She taught you how to hunt and trap? Yeah, yeah. She taught me how camping out and everything. She's a, she's a really trapped, and, you know. She was kind of mm -hmm. young. Yeah. Who taught her? Uh, my grandfather. Your gr yeah. grandfather? Yeah. She had her own trap line too? Hmm? She had her own trap line? Uh, yeah, sometimes, yeah. She had her own trap line. They learned to know that in Bailey Island. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did you, she used to trap? Hmm? What did you use to trap, you and your mom? White foxes. Mainly white foxes? Oh, colored. White foxes, yeah, lots of white foxes. Yeah. Some years, yeah. some mm -hmm. years, some years, uh, not too much, but still there. <laughs> <laughs> mm. How about around here? Did you used to trap around here too? Uh, yeah, we trapped from here, and. Uh, I trap from here. I was, I was, uh, I just about get old enough to uh, start camping out from here. Where did you used to go? No, I used to go out to Portland Island mm -hmm. with my mom, you know. Yeah. And hunt right by, by the land here, uh, what you call that, Joe Teddy's uh, campsite mm -hmm. further up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's where you used to trap? Mm-hmm, much yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. All over, Husky Lakes and Tuck area, right? you know, all around there. Eh? All around there, eh? a hundred rats. But the white foxes you go to uh, Pole Island. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Used to set I traps? Hmm? Set traps? Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> set traps. No, nothing that type. Mm -hmm. No white people, no school, nothing too. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, completely nothing. Compared to today. You know, yeah. yeah. But it, 
So how did you used to go out? Me? Checking your chat? Uh, dog team. By dog team? Yeah, mm -hmm. dog team. So you had your own team? or you, Oh, with me and my mom, we used one team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we kind of fought yeah, two teams at that time. There's no fish net, nothing. It's handy, yeah. Yeah. How many dogs you had? Mm, about seven most of the time. Six, seven. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you checked your traps at um, Pullen Island, you used to camp out on the land? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for how camping long? out there. Yeah. How long you used to oh, stay? About three or four days sometimes. Oh. Mm. So there's a lot of traps to check it? Well, we didn't have any too many traps here that time. You can look at how 20, 30. 40 or anything like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. To skin them and dry them, the, mm -hmm. the yeah. fur is Yeah, we'll dry them, skin them, dry them. She knew how it. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, I can do it my own. When we were here, I can camp out and everything. Yeah. After two or three years been here, I start camping out. I was about 18 then. I remember one time I had no tent. I went up in the line in May. I was out there for one week uh, hunt, hunting rats. And, and my parents at that time was really worried about me because I got no tent, nothing, yeah. just the dogs and myself. I sleep out in the springtime, one whole week. Mm. With no tent, just then, Yeah, springtime. Uh, and uh, they went to army camp and report I was I never I never came home. I was missing for one week. I didn't realize I was uh, out there for one week because I liked it. Yeah. One of the cold days. Now I can't even, I want to go home now. Eh? No. Yeah. <laughs>